Luke chapter 22, and uh, I want to um, preach this morning a little bit um, in a way that may make some of us uncomfortable. Luke chapter 22, and um, I'll just tell you right now what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I hope um, meddles with every single one of us, because I'm going to talk about rooting out offense, rooting out offense. Luke chapter 22, verse 1. The Bible says this, the festival of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover, was approaching. And the leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Verse number 3, Luke chapter 22. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples. And he went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus. They were delighted and promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking, looking, scheming, planning, strategizing for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. Lord, I pray today that you would anoint my words as we meditate on dealing with offense in our lives. I pray, Lord, today that there would not be one person within the sound of my voice who doesn't clearly hear the dangers of holding on to bitterness and offense today. And that you would grant to all of us, at the end of this time together, a spirit of repentance and forgiveness. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Side note, do you know the number one key to revival throughout all history? Repentance. Repentance. There are things today that I would love to tell you. Uh, should, let me back up. I don't want to. I wouldn't love to tell you. There are things today I could tell you about people who have hurt me over the 49 plus years of my life. I could go into detail and tell you about people who have hurt me in the church. And it's not a competition, but, but I would argue that there is no one in the sound of my voice or watching online who has been hurt harder than I have by Christians. It is a miracle of the Lord that I am a pastor today. And I would argue that it's not just a miracle of the Lord, it's because I rightly understood how to deal with bitterness, resentment, offense, and betrayal. But at the very beginning of my message today, I want you to stop and think about this for a minute, what we just read in these six short verses. There was a man who was in Jesus' inner circle who came up with the idea of how to make a little bit of money by betraying him in a systematic way where it would actually be outside of where crowds are because he knew how popular Jesus was. Put yourself into the text for a minute with me. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the person who came to redeem mankind, who is strategizing and scheming how he could betray Jesus. It's a mind-boggling set of verses. When we read that, it should almost make us sick to our stomach. And the reason I say that to you this morning is this. We have all been betrayed by someone. And I would argue today that there are people in this room and maybe even those watching online who have not accurately, directly dealt with the offense. And you're holding on and you're harboring a root of bitterness in your heart, and you don't even see how detrimental 
it is to you. Not only have we all been betrayed by someone, we have all been hurt by Christians. And it's, we're all equally offended by Christians. But here's the bad news. We are all equally offenders. You see, what happens when you get offended is it's very easy to put on a veil of pride and believe, how could this person do this to me? They call themselves a Christian. And without even realizing it, you have slipped into self-righteousness and pride. That quick. The Bible tells us that even more cunning and crafting than Judas is the enemy of your souls who is Satan. And what we do is we strategize how deeply someone else has offended us as opposed to how deeply we have offended someone else. I'm going to give you a little tip today. I have a situation that I have to deal with today where I need to go to someone that I know that I've hurt. And I'm going to tell you my strategy. You want to know my strategy? Because I'm going to deal with it today. Number one, my name is Jamie, not Jesus. I'm not perfect. Number two, what I said there and what I did there was wrong. Full stop. And the third thing I'm going to say is, will you forgive me? That's it. It's a three-step process. It's not a debate and a conversation about what happened. It's not, you know, I was feeling this way, and so this is why. No. No justification. There is no justification. I was wrong. Period. Full stop. Now you say, well, that seems kind of basic. It is. And yet, think about how hard it is in your life. When is the last time that you knew that you had offended someone? I'm not talking about what someone did to you. I'm talking about what you did to someone else. And you said, you know what? I need to make this right. I need to acknowledge that I'm not perfect. I need to acknowledge that I was wrong. And I need to ask for forgiveness. The Bible tells us that if we're not careful, bitterness and resentment will grow out of our offense, and it will get much, much worse than that. John Rittenbaugh said this, sometimes we may view an offense as being slight. At other times, we may be offended and carry a resentment against another for the rest of our lives. Some people hardly seem to notice an offense, maybe because they do not understand its ramifications. Others seem to be able to bear the meanest of personal attacks, though undoubtedly very hurt, they quickly recover and can continue without resentment toward the offender. Offense, offenses, offend, offended, and offender appear a total of 73 times in the Bible. Several writers, as well as Jesus, give the subject of offense close scrutiny. So serious is the subject that Jesus pronounces a solemn woe against those by whom the offense comes in Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. In verse 6, he says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus said to deal ruthlessly with offense. The book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19 says this, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. When you hold on to offense, you are almost impenetrable from someone else on the outside. In some cases, it's only through a breakdown of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life where you truly release anything that you are harboring, you ask for forgiveness, you walk in repentance, and you are restored by the Holy Spirit. But it is a very, very difficult process. So how should we handle offense? Turn over with me to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. I got a lot of stuff to talk about today, so I'm going to go quickly 
Um, I remember I used to hear preachers that would say that, and I would say, I wonder if that's just a, like a little strategy, like we're, I'm about to wrap up, or they'd say, i got a lot to talk about. No, today I do. I have a lot to talk about, so we need to get through this. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter is writing here, he says this in verse 1, Get rid of all be evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people. There it is again. But he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scripture says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Verse 8. He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. Now listen to this. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. Did you know that the gospel is a stumbling block to the unsaved? There's no guarantee that everyone will be saved. Did you know that? In fact, Jesus actually taught that broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that leads to life. Why? Peter just told you. He said this, because they do not obey God's word. Very simple. Very simple. The reason that the gospel, the good news is stumbling blocks to people is because they have no desire to obey. It's interesting. Verse 9, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents, foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that wage against your very souls. Be very careful to live properly, properly among your unbelieving neighbors, then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honor and behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I believe in these 12 verses, there is a pattern for us that we can follow when it comes to healing and overcoming offense in our lives. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Number one, we need to live as pilgrims, as nomads as sojourners, aliens, whatever word you want to give it. To go back to what Chaplain Michael shared, we need to live with eternity in mind. Every time I tell you that we're all going to be dead soon, a lot of you, your eyes get this big. But here's why I do that. I do that intentionally. There's a good chance that nobody reminded you of that this week. There's a good chance you didn't think about it this week. But the reality is, is that the church is part of the kingdom, which is eternal. So when you come to church, there should be a touch of eternity on everything that happens. So that when you leave church, you go away reminded that you are not at home. This is not your final destination. This is not where the story ends. In fact, this is just the beginning. Leonard Ravenhill said this, he would pray, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Help me to live every single day with eternity in mind. When you live with eternity in mind, you will not hold on to petty grudges. 
Because you will realize and understand that there is coming a day very soon where you will stand before God and you will give an account for your life. So guess what? Small little grudges, you ain't got time for that. Your life is short. Isaiah says that, as, that we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. Psalm says that as well. So you don't have time to hold on to offense. You don't have time to hold the grudge. Mary Winslow said this, let us keep our, our, our eye and our hearts upon our blessed home. Earth is but a stage erected as our passage to the place Jesus has gone to prepare for us. What a place must that be with infinite power and love has engaged to provide. Oh, let us not lose sight of heaven for a moment. How prone are we to allow our minds and our hearts, our treacherous hearts, to become entangled with the baubles of a dying world. No wonder Christ exhorted us to watch and pray. Heaven is our home, our happy home. We are but strangers and pilgrims here. Try and realize it. Let us keep ourselves ready to enter with him into the marriage supper of the Lamb. In a little while, and we shall see him, not as the man of sorrows, but the king in his beauty. Then let us fight against earth and all its false attractions, for it passes away. You and I have to remember to keep our eye on the prize. Here's the thing. People are going to hurt you. People are going to betray you. People are going to let you down. Why? Because we're all people. We're not God. You're going to let people down. You're going to offend people. You're going to betray people. Oh, Pastor Jamie, not me. Get, get over yourself. Be careful. That's what Hebrews said. The writer of Hebrews said, let he, him who thinks he stands be careful as he falls quickly. Right? We don't believe in karma as Christians, but there's an element of it in the book of Hebrews. Don't get so high and mighty and think, oh, I would never treat someone like that. Yes, you would. In a cold stone second, you would. And you have. That's the reality. And so for you and I, we have to live with eternity in mind. We have to remember that we're pilgrims. Amen. Are you here today? Say amen. amen. Matthew 18, verse 2, Jesus says he calls a little child to him. And he says in verse 3 of Matthew 18, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins, there it is, and become like little children, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Never. Never. Wow, that is a profound statement from the Son of God. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. The mark of every spiritual mature believer should be humility. It should ha we should have the capacity to acknowledge what we don't know and what we're blinded to about our own lives. Secondly, if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says we should learn to live without reproach. We should learn to live without reproach. Look, anyone can be a jerk for Jesus. <laughs> right? Come on, are you here today? Anyone can be a jerk for Jesus. That's easy, right? But that's not what Peter wrote in verse 8 through 10 of, of 1 Peter chapter 2. Go back and look at it again. He says this, 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, he says verse 8, or verse 9. Or what am I looking for here? I'm lost. I'm, I, I got to get back to where, where I was. Um, he says, they stumble because they do not obey God's word, so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. So he gives an example of opposites. He says, this is how the world lives, acts, and behaves. 
That should not be how you live, act, and behave. There should be something inside of you that desires to be Christ-like. And you know what? It's very, very, I'm going to be honest with you. It's very difficult in the world that we live in that is filled with hatred, resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness. It's very, very difficult to be immersed in our, our, in our culture and not pick up its habits. And so we have to be, I think that's what Mary Winslow was saying when she talked about Jesus saying, watch and pray. Sometimes I get myself into a situation where I know I'm going to do something or say something dumb. And I, go, I got to go, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. Seal my lips, Lord, because I'm about to say something I'm going to regret. Come on, we've all been there, haven't we? Someone comes at you and they say something, you're like, Woo, I'm, I've been waiting for this moment. And the Holy Spirit says, don't go there. Just put a check on your... But Lord, you don't understand. They did this, said this, blame this. Blah. And all you get from the Lord is, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why, why do you think? Because it's not actually going to benefit you. You know what I'm learning as I get older? I don't care if I'm right about any, everything. Don't care. Don't care. But it also means that I'm also not going to care what other people think about me. Don't care. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care. And when you live in such a way that you're focused on pleasing the Lord, that's the key. When your life is focused on pleasing the Lord, if you're, if you're busy, and you should be, if you're busy saying, you know, that's what Paul told the Ephesians, find out. Find out what pleases the Lord. Find out. Find out. Research. When you're doing that, you don't have time to deal with the petty stuff. You're like, look, I'm, in, I'm doing my thing. I'm trying to please God. Now, there may be people that are not helping you with that, and you need to separate yourself from them. You may look at this person and say, look, when you and I are together, it doesn't go well because we're not focused on the same thing. You know, there are Christians today who aren't focused on pleasing the Lord. They're focused on being right. There's a profound thought. And so we got to be very, very careful. What does it mean to be above reproach? Tim Challies, who's a blogger, I, I found this. I thought this was so good. He wrote about this on his blog. He said, what does it mean to be above reproach? What the ESV translate as, translates as above reproach is first a legal word that indicates a kind of innocence in the eyes of the law. It means that no one can legitimately rebuke you or make any charges against you that will stick. I was watching this show last night, uh, and I'm weird. You guys know that. I watch weird stuff on TV. It's one of those crime shows where, um, and maybe you heard the story, but there was a woman, and she was divorced, and she was dating this guy, and they had a very tumultuous relationship involving abuse and lots of bad things, and they were together one night, and she kind of, um, th they were playing this game, she said, and she said, again, she said, they were playing hide-and-go-seek, and she, he got in a suitcase, and she zipped him up. This was her account of the story. And eventually he died. He suffocated to death. And I watch this because I'm fascinated by human behavior. Because so many times we fake it with each other. We put on our best behavior. We, we lie to each other. Do you know we lie to each other? How are you doing? I'm doing good. No, you're not. But we say it. It's just, it's just commonplace. And I watch this lady try to, to explain what she did. Unfortunately, she didn't realize because she was drunk, she recorded a couple of videos where when he was pleading for his life, she cursed at him and said, that's what you get. And watching her try to explain and validate it was excruciatingly painful because she had no excuse. She was guilty. Everybody who could see it knew it. What, what I believe Tim Challies is saying here is that when people accuse you, they should not be able to find anything that sticks. 
In other words, there's no record of you at the scene of the crime. Hello? That's what the Bible talks about. They said, look, you're going to suffer reproach. You're going to be persecuted. Jesus said it. Paul said it. Peter said it. But it, what they said is, make sure it's for the right things. Not for being a jerk for Jesus. Make sure it's because you're living above reproach. He goes on to say, they may accuse you, but your conduct will eventually acquit you by proving you blameless. Blameless being a far more common translation than above reproach. Your life is so consi consistent that your reputation is credible. You are an example worth following and you do not make the gospel look fake by teaching one thing while doing another. We live in a world that is monetizing saying one thing and doing the other. Hello? Hello? And so you say, well, this is hard. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> I'll, I'm right there with you. I'm sitting in the seat next to you. I'm going, yeah, that's hard. It's hard to live above reproach. But you got to do it. And your reputation is who you are when no one can see you. That's a scary thought. Your reputation is who you are when no one can see you. When you are simply alone, you, you think you're alone, but you don't realize you're alone before God. He can see you. 1 Peter chapter 3, if you skip over one chapter in verse 13, he goes on to say this, is what I just described to you. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. I, I often tell people that in certain things, and I say this certain things because I've had to, to reconcile this in my life. In certain things, I have a very sensitive conscience. It's, I'm human. I'm not perfect. I'm sinful. I'm a fallen creature. But there are certain things that I have a very sensitive conscience about. I don't know why that is, but I have one. Lying to me is a horrible, 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 horrible thing. If I feel like I'm being disingenuous or not telling the truth, I feel terrible <laughs> inside. You know what I'm talking about where you can't sleep at night? Terrible. But there are other things I know that I overlook and don't even think about that I do. Right? That's what Paul said. Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I should do, I don't, right? He, he goes through this, this, this thing, and he, this is what he says. Who will save me from this body of sin? So even if you're sensitive on some things, but you're ignorant on others, the bottom line is you and I are just like the Apostle Paul. And what we need to say is, the things that I should do, I don't. And the things that I shouldn't do, those are the things I do very well. Right? Who will save me from this body of sin? Well, it's Jesus. That's what he said. The sacrifice of Jesus. The reason we have Easter. The reason we celebrate Easter. Is because he took Jesus who knew no sin. And made him sin for us. He took the punishment for our sins. And there's, look, listen. Listen to me. You know yourself. There is no saving you outside of Jesus. Just come clean. There is no hope for you outside of Jesus. There is no hope for me outside of Jesus. There is nothing. The little bit of crumbs that I could possibly scrape together of my own righteousness would be kablammied by my sin. Just be blotted out. And no more. So my only hope is to rely on Jesus, which leads to number three. And this is so important, I think, when it comes to dealing offense. We should never forget that we have offended God. Think about that. The biggest reason, arguably, that we shouldn't hold on to an offense 
is that we have most likely offended others, and more importantly, we have offended God. D.A. Carson said this, The idea is not simply that we have been forgiven, and therefore we ought to forgive, but that God himself in Christ has forgiven us, and therefore our debt is incalculable. You ever check your bank account so you know how much is actually there? What he says here is there's no way to accurately measure the amount of sinful debt that you owed to a holy God. Can't do it. Can't do it. There's Because you're finite. You, you, you operate in this realm, right? You, you only know what you know and you're ignorant of all these things. But if you could actually see it on the screen, here's the debt you owe. It'd be worse than our debt in America. No matter how many you know, like there's no paying that back. <laughs> and the clock's just ticking, right? You're like, I'm, I'm 70. I've lived a long life. I think I'm getting better. Nope, the clock's still ticking. You're rolling up the debt. Sin, 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 sin. And it ain't going to stop before you die. Hello? It's not going to stop rolling. You owed a debt you couldn't pay. He goes on to say this, no matter how much wretched evil has been done against us, it is little compared to the with the offense that we have thrown in the face of God. Yet. God in Christ forgave us. Think about that. If we know anything of the release of this forgiveness, if we have glimpsed anything of the magnitude of the debt we owe to God, our forgiveness of others will not seem to be such a large leap. I, I, at the beginning, I talked about praising people. But I want to ask you a question as we close this morning. When is the last time you really walked out Matthew chapter 5 or Matthew chapter 18? I know you say, What's Matthew 5? What's Matthew 18? I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, says this. I say, if you are subject, or I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to just judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Verse 23. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer sacrifices to God. In other words, picture an altar call. Jesus says, don't even bother to come if you haven't reconciled with the person that you've offended. You see, there's a, there's, a, there's a step we have to take. It's not an easy step. But if you've ever done it, you see the look of shock and awe on the other person's face. It's the grace and the humility that you bring through the power of the Holy Spirit where they actually don't know what to do. Because they're so used to just people, you know, spiritually throwing up on them, emotionally throwing up on them, that when you actually come to someone, you say, listen, I'm not a perfect person. I made a mistake. Please forgive me. They're like, uh, nobody told me what to do in this situation. <laughs> if anything, they might say, oh, it wasn't that big a deal. And you say, no, no, listen, it was a big deal. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You can't help but have a moment of humility with that person. They don't have anything to throw back at you because what you're acknowledging is yourself. You're saying, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm not going to sing the Taylor Swift song. Don't be worried. <laughs> Ada loved that joke. That's all that matters. <laughs> she likes the song, she said. Hey, it's a, good, it's a good illustration. It's me. The problem is me, right? The person doesn't know what to do because they're they, maybe they're coming with swords like we're, we're going to do this again. Right. And you're like, no, I'm the problem. One more verse. Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew, chapter 18. 
Jesus says this in Matthew 18, verse 15. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two with you and go again so that everything you may be, say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. So there's two different things happening here, right? I really, I'm done. There's two different things happening. You have offended someone. Matthew chapter 5, right? So you go to them and you say, it's me. Now I'm, now I'm not going to be able to get that song out of my head. <laughs> the problem is me, right? Or the second thing is they have offended you. Now here's the thing. If that happens, go with grace. Because what I have experienced is many times they're totally unaware. Right? They didn't realize because we just, we live in our own bubble. We live, what does you call it? Shell. Shell on Wednesday. We live in our own cocoon, our own bubble. We're just going through the motions. We're doing things. Like for me as a guy, as a dude, married for 25 years, how many of you know, I set a lot of traps for myself. Eric, right? I fall into them still. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. But I've been there. And Jody's come to me and I'm like, I'm sorry, was that bad? <laughs> was I not supposed to say that? <laughs> and and what I what I, I have two options in that moment. I could try to explain to her, which I've done, this is what you don't do, by the way. I try to explain where I was coming from, what I was thinking, all that sort of stuff. But guess what? Doesn't matter. Or I can say, I'm sorry. And guess what? The bridge goes both ways. It's a two-way bridge. In marriage, it's a two-way bridge. And so this is why the most powerful thing that you can do in life, and specifically in marriage, is worry about yourself. Worry about yourself. You can't control the other person. I can't control. To this day, married 25 years, I cannot control Jody. And I think if we get 25 more years at 50, I'll have less control. Right? What I can control is me. And so I can come before the Lord first and foremost, because that's the most important thing. Lord, search my heart. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and see if there's any wicked way. Sometimes I do that and I get nothing. And then I go, I'm probably still wrong. You see, here's the thing. You can never lose with humility. But Proverbs said, certain destruction awaits you with pride. You can never lose with humility, but certain destruction awaits you with pride. And so what we need to do in this moment, I believe, is just bow our heads, bow our hearts, and just say, Lord, do that. Search me. Lord, see if there be any wicked way in us. Lord, we want to be free of offense. We want to be able to be a clear channel of blessing to others from the throne of heaven by not holding on to bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment. And Lord, I pray today that you would just continue to speak to our hearts these things we've looked at from your word today. That throughout this week, we would just go back time and time again and say, Lord, just like in the Lord's prayer, prayer deliver us from evil. Help us to forgive as we, you have forgiven us. Let us put that into practice. Lord, especially in this Easter season, we pray. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me this morning?